Hi, welcome to the Futuristic Africa Talk, conversations that will shape the future of Africa. I am your host, God's Will Iwanafu. On this episode, we speak to Pumlani Majosi, a world-renowned political economist that talked of different topics from African economics to global economics. I'm so excited to have him. He's a very good friend of mine. Let's get into it, ladies and gentlemen. The Futuristic Africa Talk. Brought to you by Ovid Capita. Conversations that will shape the future of Africa. The African consumer is not who we've been told they are. They're uh, complex, they're multidimensional, they're dynamic. So people look around the world and they say, where is it that we have a consumer base of that sort of size, a young consumer base that's also yeah, really that important. was. I think there's a wide acknowledgement that Africa is rising. I think we have an optimistic, we're the optimistic first of the earth, really, because at the same time... Africa doesn't need aid, but Africa needs a lot of inflow of capital from other areas of the world. Better Africa means there remains an observation that the perceived risks of investing in Africa is much higher than the actual risk. It is my hope that our aspiration will come to fruition. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fourth episode of the Futuristic Africa Talk, conversations that will shape the future of Africa. On this episode, I have a very important guest for you, a very amazing guest. I mean, this young man has written numerous times. He has he sits on the a number of boards dealing with political economy, dealing with economy across Africa and South Africa. He has written numerous times about Africa, South Africa, and the world, uh, the global world as a whole on matters from political science to economic, uh, to economics, governance, etc. So our host, I mean, our guest today is Pumlani Majosi. I'm so excited to have him. So um, let me quickly hand him over to hand the mic over to him to say a few words. We can kick off the session. Pumlani, welcome to the Future of the Africa Talk. It's a pleasure Thank you so to much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here to have a, a very important discussion. It's my first time here in this podcast. So um, I look forward. I really appreciate the, the invitation. And thank you so much for the, the kind words that you have just uh, said about me. Um, you know, I really appreciate it. Um, it will keep me, or it keeps me, you know, it keeps me going, you know, it keeps me going. You know, words like that, they, they encourage me to, to, to keep on, you know, with the work that I am doing. So thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Pumlani, let's just, um, let's kick start and let's jump straight into it. Why is Africa poor? <laughs> well, it's... um. It's a big question, um, and um, books have been written about it as to why we are in this state of um, of poverty where we are. Because when you look at the data, uh, the African uh, continent is the poorest in the world. Um, not long time ago, um, I think it was a few weeks back, weeks back, I should say, Bloomberg um, in its weekly newsletter titled The Next Africa. They use that line, you know, that Africa uh, is the most poorest, uh, poorest continent in the world. And that's a reality. So th that fact is there. Now to come to your question as to why it is where it is, there are many factors that play to this. Now people have pointed to our history that we've had colonialism, that we've had, um, you know, repression of yes. some sort. Um, that we've had, um, you know, the foreign foreign influence, uh, foreign repression in our continent that has, you know, suppressed, you know, um, economic development or prosperity, if I can put um, it in that way. Now, that that is valid. That is a valid point. But my argument is that 
it's it's bigger than that um what we are facing in other words the factors that have led us to poverty um you know this matter of colonialism past repression all countries have been colonized before um singapore was dead poor in 1965 um so yes. and today it's one of the richest you know countries in the world um, so for me, I think that it, it, it's, it's got less to do about the fact that we were, we, were, we were once colonized and more to do with the following. Now, what I'm going to say to you will explain as to why, will give the exact answer as to why Africa is poor. Um, it's a matter of uh, economies that are underproductive, right? We are not producing what needs to be produced at a level we have to produce to not only consume, but also to sell to the market, right? Now we are a commodity-based kind of continent where we, ex we extract raw, raw materials and just send them to, you know, to various countries. But now all we do is exactly that. There are no other industries to, to, to produce more in terms of goods and services, um, to, be able, to be able to consume and sell you know, in the global market. And the fact that we we um, we we the fact that we extract raw materials and just send them to other countries instead of um, you know refining them ourselves, not having the capabilities to refine our raw materials, that again is problematic. Now, that makes me come to the second point, which is basically around the absence or the lack of human capital. Now, by human capital, I'm talking about education, knowledge and skills in sophisticated fields, the fields that can produce the goods and services that are in high demand in the market. That's one issue Africa faces, that our, our, um, our human capital is not competitive, it's at low levels, it's not something that can add greater value in the, you know, in the global market. Now, Another one that has been pointed out as to why we are where we are basically has to do with the very rapid population growth in the African continent. Some people have written that, you know, over the past, let's say 40, uh, 40 years, there has been, we've seen Africa's economic growth getting stronger, but guess what? Africa's poverty in absolute terms really hasn't, it's been, it's become, it's still stagnant. Um, it has it, it has it, it has declined, but at very low levels compared to the Asian countries in Latin America, other de developing continents as well. It's 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 been at very low level, uh, low level. Now, population growth is has been pointed, and I think it's a valid argument, and I think it is true that the fact that we our population growth cannot keep up. You know, sorry, our economic growth cannot keep up with a very rapid population growth is a problem because your economic growth needs to be greater than your population growth. Economic growth must be greater than, greater than population growth. So you are able, so the population can, so the economy can keep up with the rising population. So those issues have been quite um, very much, um, you know, um, blocking Africans from achieving rapid economic progress. Now, another one also has to do with the political instabilities that we see in the African continent. That's another factor again, where we see um, dictatorships over the past 40 years or so, where we see um, conflicts, where we see high levels of corruption, uh, where we see leaders really abusing their power um, instead of serving the needs of the people. Now that needs to be highlighted because it has to do with the problems of governance in Africa. That the governance problem is something that is really making it hard for Africans to advance for Africans to advance forward. Let me give you give you give you an example. The DR Congo, the Democratic, Repub Democratic Republic of Congo, that country, the eastern side of the country, almost half of it, you can say there's no governance there, right? There's no security, there are no laws, there are no, you know, there are no institutions that um, almost 
almost you know the, the I mean the, the eastern part of Kiar Congo, there's no governance, you know, lawlessness. And there are many countries like that, countries like that, where there is no law and order or institutions that can enforce that. So those issues I have mentioned, they have very much, um, they are very much sort of, you know, um, um, slowing our economic progress. Now, the last one I will mention that can be controversial to, to many people is that we also have a culture that really does not help much in terms of much in terms of advancing economic prosperity or economic development, right? We are very materialistic that even those who have a hand in wealth or those who are wealthy or those who are already well off, um, there is a tendency that we misuse our, 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 you know, our financial, financial fortunes, right? And that we are people who really don't invest much, who don't invest and save. We like to spend as soon as we can, you know, access funds or access the money, we spend it on material, material things instead of investing. So the investment culture is also problematic. Um, our, when we look at also the high rates of the, the family breakdown, um, that is also a problem because the family breakdown is also the family, a stronger family unit is critical for economic development. If we have kids growing, growing up in broken families, that is going to slow down um, the, the socioeconomic progress. So all those things I have mentioned, they are more structural, they are more you know, deep, they need to be addressed by the citizens of Africa themselves. They cannot be addressed by anybody. So that's how, that's how, that's how when people start saying, well, it's colonialism, now China is coming to colonize us, we should blame the West. I do not buy that, you know. It's us, the problems are within. We need, to, we need to address them. We need to implement the structural reforms. Um, because it's, it, it's all structural, you know. We need to implement those reforms, change our mindset, change, change the way of doing things, cooperate um, for the betterment of the African continent. So that's where the issue is for Africa. It's something that can only be resolved by Africans themselves. Thank you so much, Bunani. You speak so beautifully. Um, and the way you give empirical reasons for why Africa is where it is, it's so outstanding. You know, I've spoken to many political economists, many political analysts, many political scientists in Africa, and they often give the, they often play the blaming game. Um, they blame China, they blame the West, they blame the external influence, and they don't look within to the factors um, affecting the continent and why we are where we are. So thank you so much. Um, as all. You know, I'm not disappointed by my role model, but my hero. Um, everyone can see the wealth of knowledge he has and how articulate he is with the, um, the point he's making. There's a very key point that you made, um, and it ties up to something. The former director of the African Development Bank wrote a paper, I think it was it was two or three years ago, um, during or before COVID, and he's saying that um, 46 out of the 54 African countries are actually um, commodity trap. They have a commodity trap economy. And um, they cannot develop further because of the commodity traps that they are, they are in. And if they don't produce commodities, there is no money in the economy. People can pay it to see. Um, and the often they have to borrow to you know, finance development it to see. Now, how do they get out of that? Um, if you were to advise the president in terms of turning the economy around to say, let's build wealth, let's not depend on the economy on commodities, it is see, um, let's commercialize, let's you know, industrialize, it is see. How do you advise him to go about that? Look, the fact that we do have the commodities that we commodities that we can dig on the from the ground and be able to sell, that's a that that's an advantage. You know, that there's something that we can, you know, we can sell in the market. Um, that's not a bad thing. It's good. But the question is, how do you, how do we take the proceeds or the proceeds that we get from the sale of those commodities to transform our economies? Now, transform our economies, how? That's a very good question. So take the proceeds and look at how can you grow other industries, right? In other words, think about, think about banking, financial services industry, think about insurance, um, uh, tourism um, as well. 
technology, think about those industries. How do you, the objective for African leaders must be, how do we take the money we get from oil, you know, and, 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 and build other industries? Um, and how do, it's not, it's not on, and building other industries also speaks to investing in human capital that will be needed for those industries to thrive, grow, create jobs and contribute in the global you know, um, market. I, I always like to refer to the global market in my writings and in my talks now, because we are living in a globally competitive market where nations are competing, right? We are competing with China, we are competing with them, um, with countries in Latin America, uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina. Uh, we, we are competing with them, you know, countries in, countries in South, Southeast Asia, Asia as well. So um, the objective for African leaders, policymakers, must be how do we take the proceeds that we get and, you know, grow other industries. Um, and growing those industries means that you also need to build capabilities or institutions. Some of them will be educational to be able to, um, you know, to produce the human capital that will sustain and grow those industries. Now, it's very important that we, we are also very much open to attracting, attracting inver, in investment in that process. So we are opening industries. How can we make it, how can we make those industries to be attractive to American investors? You know, EU investors, Chinese investors, you know, um, Latin American investors, those industries. How do we sort of put in policies and, and, and mechanisms that will attract investment for those people to come and say, we can come and invest in that technological company in DR Congo, you know, in Gabon, right? Uh, in Zambia, in Malawi, because we think that company, you know, can grow, right? Now, what I'm saying is very important because even those people who invest, they can only, they, they can only invest in companies that, that operate in a politically stable environment, right? Where property rights, private property rights are protected and um, you know, enforced, law and order is enforced. Because an investor isn't gonna say, an investor won't say, well, I mean, they are not going to invest in a country where their money or the, or the, you know, the company in which they invested in may disappear in a year, or may be raided by government, or may disappear. May just something may 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 happen to it that destroys it because of the unstable political environment. So, so again, it touches on those structural kind of reforms that you need, but. To, 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 be, to summarize the answer to your question as to how do we, do we move to that? It's a matter of um, the, the leaders being objective and the people as well being objective and saying, um, having a goal and saying that we are going to take that which we can at this point receive money from, or we can, we're gonna, we're gonna take the money that we get from what we, we, we currently are able to sell um, in the global market. And then we grow the, 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 the industries that we don't have in order to, to, to balance things. That's how I see these things, this thing for Africa. All right. Um, so Thomas Sowell wrote, I think it was Intellectuals and Society, about the reason why most countries are, you know, poor and underdeveloped, post independence, and one of the reasons it touched on was the education of leaders. Apart from the general education of the population, the education of leaders. When you look at some um, countries in, in Southeast Asia, Korea, Japan, China, most of the leaders that governed them went into hard skills. 
um, they studied hard skill subjects. Um, they have hard skills, um, you know, knowledge, etc. And they focus on application and development. You have people from tech, um, engineering to economics. But in Africa, most inter most leaders that govern states they went to study on um, soft skills, political science, arts, um, all of those uh, linguistics, anthropology. And often, okay, I'm a PPE student, I understand. Often what you're taught in those fields are political ideas, how to debate um, the empire. It is not how to develop. So um, will you say that there is a contributing fact? And if you can, um, let's point it to the US. I mean, the US was actually developed by people with political ideas. Um, Get Britain the same was people with political ideas. Even Israel, the Zionist movement that led to Israel was a political idea and was led by um, social scientists. So, what do you have to say to Thomas Sowell's um, argument that it's the education of the leaders or the type of education that the leaders got post independence that led to where we are currently? You see, my view is that that may be the case. Um, what we have just, I'm talking, I'm talking about what we have just said now that our leaders are more political. They're, they're not trained, trained or educated in, um, you know, in, in hard science, right? So in STEM, uh, science, technology, mathematics, engineering. So, but for me, I think, even though you may not be educated in those fields, but you are educated enough to understand what does the world need at this point in time? Well, not just, okay, if I say what does the world need at this point in time, I'm saying I'm talking about the global market. What, what does the global market want? Surely we are all educated enough to understand what really is in demand in the global market, right? Um, and then, when you understand as to what it is that is demanded, demanded, demanded in the market, then you don't have to be skilled yourself in those things mm. that can shape Africa. What, 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 what are you going to do? You are going to look, look and say, okay, here's, here's, here's how things are in the world. This is how Africa needs to navigate this new world. How do I bring it? Yes, I may not know much, um, you know, not trained in the fields of STEM, but I can get people who can, I can surround, surround myself with the people who understand these things, right? A, lead, a, leader, a leader doesn't have to know everything. Presidents, they don't know everything, right? They have helpers, aides, uh, advisors around them. This is where we are on artificial, artificial intelligence, this is where Africa is, this is what we need, you know. This is where, this is where we are in manufacturing, um, this is what Africa needs um, to be able to, to compete around the world, and therefore we advise this, right. This, this is where we are in the airlines industry, um, this is what the trends are in the global market. This is where Africa is. And how do you reshape that to be globally competitive? So Thomas Shaw, um, of course, has a good you know, factor there to point out. But I don't think that it is something that can be a blockade to Africa's progress. Because as a leader, um, it's something that can be, you know, that can be changed. You can say, yes, I'm a political person, but I, I can read and see what's going on in the, in the global market. And I can have advisors or people who can help me to, you know, to, 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 to advance what I am, what I am, um, what I want to achieve for the progress of, um, of Africa. So Seoul is a good point, but I don't think we should let such a point slow us down and say, well, we are going to wait up until, or we need to wait up until we find people who are trained in hard, hardcore skills and so on. No, you know, let's rather use people who are already out there to advise the president 
to be able to, you know, to, to, to better, um, uh, to, to advise African leaders to be able to, to better um, the continent. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, let's, let's untackle a point that you made earlier, investment um, in Africa. So you spoke about political instability and the reason to be investor friendly for African countries. Um, most countries all over the globe, even countries that are very developed, are not politically stable. I mean, look at what happened in the US early last year. Um, we have got protests occurring in Europe now and again, in France, there were a few going on. Um, in Hong Kong, ETC. Africa, there is a there is a lot of politically stable countries. Um, especially when you look at countries like Ghana, South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, um, you know, and then you go up north to the MENA region or the Northern African region. You find a lot of good economies um within Africa, but they are not competitive enough compared to their um to countries of such size or such level of development outside of the continent. Um Please help us untangle that. Why is that the case? I mean, on, on top of that, um, let's just analyze something here. So David Robin has been very um, optimistic about Africa, and he's written last year, last year after giving the talk at um, the, the African Venture Capital and Panam and PE Association. He wrote an article saying that he's been coming into Africa with his own private money, um, in partnership with Atera Capital. And um, he believes that Africa is going to grow. We see BlackRock right now starting a, a new investment management firm with Discovery. Um, these are strategies for global firms moving to the continent. But um, we are not competitive enough like other um, you know, external economies of such size. Why is that the case? And how can we change that? How can we become more competitive is your point. Um, when you look at South Africa's competitiveness, competitiveness, there is another competitiveness index by um, uh, an organization, an organization called IMD. I think in, it's Institute of Management something. So your 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 viewers can just check that online. They do the the, the global competitiveness. And they usually take about 60, 63 countries. And last time I checked, this was last year, South Africa's ranking was right at the bottom. I think bottom three, bottom, bottom four, five or something. So that's a very bad record. Um, but your, your question is how do you become competitive, competitive in the global market? Um, let me point you to one thing. That is very, that has been raised even by the World Bank, not just me, uh, people who have raised this thing. And that is the matter of, when you look at manufacturing um, in, may, in many African countries, Africa, South Africa is worst. The labor costs, they are quite, they are very high, right? The, the reason why Apple and many other big companies go to Asian countries, China, you know, Vietnam to produce is because of the labor costs there, they're not as high. Now in the Africa region, that remains a problem, right? In South Africa leads, South Africa leads in terms of the very high labor costs. Um, and, and remember high labor costs means that you lack, comp you lack competitiveness and that's a problem. Um, the IMD also points to uh, in their competitive competitive index index report, they they point to the matters of infrastructure. That if you don't have stronger infrastructure, you are you are going to be less competitive because what it is that you are providing to be competitive in the market. Africa is a very big problem on in, on infrastructure. Um, I've been to, I've been, in fact, I've been to, um, I've been, I'm, I'm in South Africa, I've been to Kenya, I've been to um, Nigeria as well. And I see huge differences in terms of infrastructure, right? And we need stronger infrastructure in Africa to be able to be competitive. But such things cannot be achieved overnight. It's about having a strategic goal, being wise, in how you spend, coming back to what I sort of laid out earlier as to how do we reshape our industries? 
to be less commodity dominated, you know. Um, so if you do what I said earlier, and that you are able to, to, to build your infrastructure out of that, you are going to become more competitive. Resolve the issues of labor costs that are quite problematic for the African continent. Um, and the regulatory environment, the Fraser Institute, the Fraser Institute, which is a very much free market think tank in Canada, releases even the Heritage Foundation as well, based in America, they do the, what they call economic freedom index, where they look at the, the, the levels of capitalism, uh, private property rights, law and order, regulatory environment in individual countries, and then rank them, right? Africa ranks at the bottom of that. African countries, the back of them, they rank at the bottom in that index. Why? Because of very low rates of sort of capitalist methods as to how you, you govern economies. So if you, if you, if you don't have that, um, if we rank very low on those you know, metrics, how do you expect us, expect us to be competitive? Now, let me, you spoke, you said there are countries in Africa that are politically stable. Yeah, sure, there are countries where there isn't any sort of, um, today there are, but there are also many that still really, um, that have been ruled for a long time by, um, you, know, you know, dictators. If a, if a dictator is ruled for a long, very long time, and we know our, of our history in Africa, that gives a different perception, right? If the institutions themselves, they are not really stable enough to enforce law and order, again, that gives another, you know, another um, impression, at least to international investors. So this is not to say that there isn't, we are not saying that here everything is negative and everything, everything is bad. Africa has made progress over the past 30 years. There has been progress in Africa. But it's, the point is that it's been minimal, even in poverty terms, even in political stability that we are trying to highlight that there are, yes, there has been progress there, but compared to other regions, we are still left behind. So the question is, how do we move forward faster than, you know, than, you know, where we are, than the speed at which we are we are sort of moving at this point. So I, I, I don't want your audience to misunderstand me that everything is negative on Africa. No, there has been progress. Even in South Africa, there has been progress compared to 30 years ago. But we are saying that it's not speedy enough compared to other regions. We could do better. And that, that the gains um, over the past 30, 35 years have been very minimal. Okay, let's move on to a point you made in your first um, statement about why Africa is poor, and there is a materialistic culture of Africans. If you look at simple economics, um, you end when someone else spends, when I spend, someone else ends, spend is not a bad thing. But um, help me understand what you mean by the materialistic nature of Africans. Um, isn't spending a great economy? I mean, during COVID, when my boss was asking people to spend more in South Africa, what the, what's the issue with spending? Um, I understand that people have to save and invest, but just untangle that a bit. I want you to draw a line between what um, is wrong spending and rightful investments or rightful spending, it is it. Mm. Well, the question is when you spend at an, at an individual level, when you spend, are you spending for, for the long-term return or are you spending for just consumption? Um, and we've been, we've been, we've, we are really, we are kind of a very consuming sort of um, culture that we have instead of investing in things that are good for the long term. I'll give you a, a, I'll give you a very sort of basic example. Um, you know, we tend to be very much investing in things like that are not really investment. Think of things like, you know, cars that we buy. We buy expensive cars. A car is not an investment, right? 
um, we spend on consumption. Um, I'm, I'm talk, I'm, by, by, the, by the way, I'm talking about at, at an individual level. I'm not talking about government spending. I'm talking about individual private spending of people, the habits of spending. Um, so we are not, we are spending in things that are sort of expensive. When you look at um, the indebtedness of South Africans, the data, I mean, private indebted, indebtedness, you are, it's really staggering um, as to people are indebted, right? And we cannot, we, we should not, not, given our social economic condition, we should not neglect or just do away with something that I've, that I've stressed for a long time. And that is, that is personal responsibility, right? And this is where now we are talking about personal responsibility. How do you as an individual sort of focus more towards investing in things that will grow you over the long term than investing in consumption, right? Um, in your human skills, in your human capital, uh, your knowledge, your education, um, in things that can grow your wealth, um, whether it's in equities or in the investment world, whether it's in a property or whatever. In other words, you direct more of your funds there than spending in consumption. So this thing, our spending patterns as a society of individuals is something that can suppress us down, right? Instead of you know, spending on things that can grow us over the long term. And by the way, remember the objective is to increase your wealth. That's what you want to achieve. You want to be wealthy as an individual. And being wealthy to getting to that, to that point where you are wealthy, there are significant decisions we have to make where you redirect your way of spending from things of consumption that you can just consume right now to your, you know, um, um, you know, things that can grow you over, over term. Now, I think your point also may be that, well, if, uh, if we go out there and buy all these nice things, we are also putting the money into the economy and, um, you know, um, for other people, people can, can get jobs and so on. Yes, sure, that is fine to do that. Um, it's, that is happening. That the money, but at an individual level, in other words, you've, you are disadvantaging yourself um, if you are really going to, um, you know, say, okay, I'm earning my money and therefore I'm going to go and spend on consumption so that I can help, help other people to be able to, you know, to have their businesses. So we must, post, over the long term, you are going to be indebted. Um, it may look nice now, but that's a short term, there's a short term benefit there. Over the long term, you have a social class or a society that is heavily indebted. Um, some people will commit suicide, they will, um, you know, undergo their counseling. Um, even those com the companies that borrowed those people the money, um, um, where the, they will collapse. You know, that's where you will start to see, but that, that usually happens over the long term. That's why for politicians, they like to do things that are short term because by the, the, the long term implications by then, they'll be long gone. So we need to be strategic. Let's not do things just for now. Let's rather, rather do things for the long term as well, for the, for the long term as well, as, 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 um, as, uh, as people. So, so for me, we need to, to, to be able to, at an individual level, to strategize and be able to be in the people who are financially, who have financial peace, uh, have financial freedom. If I can, if I can use those terms. All right, thank you so much. Um, save so you can invest in useful assets. So let me just go off topic a bit. The Futurist Africa talk was brought to you by Over Capital. Over Capital is a private equity investment from Business UK. They're currently selling tokens um, that can enable Africans with small income to invest in emerging com companies on the continent through the Africa Opportunity Fund. So if anyone um this is what Poblan is saying about to invest the money, want to spend wisely, um just head on to Ovi Capital, um the IO, or sorry, Ovi Token IO, Ovi Capital.com, and you learn more about Ovi Capital. Now, Pumlani, there is um a philosophy I carry from myself, and I got it from my mentor. And this is that um 
you know, Africa is going to be the next world power. Now, let me break that down for you. It's going to be? Uh, the next world power after East Asia. So let me okay. break that down for you. Um, John G. Glob in his essay, The Fate of Empires, um, studied and found that empires lasted for about a quarter of a millennium with um, the exception of the Roman Empire, which had two sessions, which was 250, 250 years, so um, half a millennium. Now, you can see that in the life of the US from the 1700s to where it is currently, now it's moving to, um, to China. After China, there's an argument that um, Africa will go to the next world order and some of the, some of the world power countries will be on the continent. Um, and that argument also analyzes that most of the things we're going through found in wars, um, you know, ETC. Western Europe went through it. Um, remember after Rome colonized Western Europe and left that during the Dark Ages, Western Europe went to all of those, you know, in development, ETC too. I mean, they, they, um, they till around 1000, the, the, um, the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s, that's when they started developing a bit. I mean, in those 1100 years, England was being raided by Scandinavia countries. So there's an argument, and even for the US, when they started out, you can see that they were being exploited by Great Britain then. There's an argument that um, there's what power after Asia, after, sorry, after East Asia, because the different um, challenges we face will propel us to develop to create high quality people, to create technological advancements. What is your thoughts on that? Uh, Professor Neil Ferguson, um, his book, uh, one of my favorite uh, favorite book of uh, books of his, uh, is called uh, called Civilization. He basically, you know, says that there are that Africa. I mean, Europe was was a mess. <laughs> You know, the West was a mess. There was poverty, yeah. there, was, there were conflicts, there were so on. I mean, it comes back to what I was saying that there is, there is no country, what, what I said earlier, there's no country that has not gone through colonialism, uh, conflicts, um, the repression, the word I used earlier. Um, so, and guess what? Those countries picked up. Now, Neil Ferguson, uh, Neil Ferguson says that there, there are six things or six, what he calls six killer apps. And I recommend, I recommend <laughs> this book to your audience. I think All it right. speaks about, um, speaks about um, uh, consumerism. Um, it speaks about um, private, private, private profit, property. Um, uh, the regulatory environment is one of the things it, speak, it speaks of. Medicine is one of those things, but it's all um, it's all things that are very much aligned to the pro market way of thinking, right? Um, that those six six things um, that has to do with the idea of you know consumers um, and and um, people buying and selling in the market, um, they were very fundamental towards moving um, you know, the West from a state of poverty to being dominant in the world, right? Now, Singapore did this within 60 years or so, right? In less than 60 years now, right? So, uh, they managed to go from poverty to being at least, I think it's at least 55,000, you know, GDP per capita of some sort. And what did they do? They did all the things that really have to be done in terms of how the economy operates, right? Or at least most of them, not everything, but most of the fundamental stuff. They did it, encouraged the market to come through, right? Now, to come to your point about the about the fate of empires, my argument is that Africa can be it can be sooner than what is being projected that they become the world's whatever. It can, with the right policies being put in place. Right. So there isn't Africa has has potential. It just needs to do the right decisions. It's public policies 
that move countries, countries from poverty and then make strides towards you know, um, stronger economies. It, it's got to do with policy. It's not like Africa will always be like this, right? It won't be always like this, but it can be like this, continuously like this, if the right decisions are not being made, such as what, such as though the, 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 the killer apps that Neil Ferguson speaks of, that were implemented, embraced by the Western nations, right? Singapore, if we do like Singapore in how, in, 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 in how the economy operates, and then also in a century, we can be much better off than where, than where we are. It's not like we'll always be like this, or we have to be like this where we are, or that we can change uh, our status, economic status. Of course, we can change. We can okay. bring the faster change in, the, yes. in our environment yes. with the right political economic decisions. Yes. Thank you. Just one more thing before you go. I know you are running out of time and you're a very busy person. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of human capital, it's a very, very important issue and you raised it very well. Now we have, um, have 1.2 billion people on the continent in in um in 28 years we're going to be 2.4 billion people on the continent or 2 billion people based on the estimations and most of those people they'll be between the age of 30 and zero years old at that time we have not started talking about how do we house these people how do we feed these people how do we educate these people? What is the jobs that these people are going to do? I know some analysts have said that we don't have to worry because the world economy will change. And basically the job argument for them then, it's it's not a main worry now, but my point it is because the world now creates the future world. If we are not futuristic, if we don't calculate for the future, we don't get to, I mean, properly um, host, um, I mean, we're going to hope we're going to be home to a quarter of the world's population by 2050. Mm -hmm. And we have not talked about all of this argument. Now, coming back to proper human capital, there is a lot of factors hindering it, right? Um, when you look at finance, when you look at the quality of teachers themselves, the curriculum, etc. And there is a lot of factors that can accelerate it um, from technology, online learning. But even these technologies require investments. Um, they require proper you know, telecommunication connections. They require the devices to connect online if we are going to utilize them. So it's still a huge challenge. Um, how, okay, I know it may be, um, you know, a, a, a hideous task, but you have a world of knowledge. How do we untackle that? You know, how do we develop, and not just um, STEM, um, STEM subjects or STEM, um, you know, knowledge, but also the knowledge to understand that we as Africans, we are human beings and we have to develop our own continent and stop pointing fingers at other people that we, where we are currently, it's no one's fault. Okay, we were colonized, yes, but it's no one's fault. We have had over 60 years of independence and we have to develop it. So take that for us. How do we get the high quality of education we need to get the high quality of human capital you know, on the continent? Well, that's a very important question. Um, it's um, it's one that needs to be thought from a private citizen point of view. Okay. And um, that's one element, and also needs to be thought from also a very important uh, point of view, and that is government government policy. You see, I, I hate to always talk about government needs to do that. The government needs to have these policies that we need to have individuals or citizens who also have a certain mindset to be able to, to, be able to move forward. We also need citizens that have a, set, you know, a certain kind of mindset to move forward as well. It's not only a public sort of policy, sort of only that we only see things from a public government policy point of view. I think for me, that is wrong way of thinking. Uh, we, need, we, need, we need to look at things from both private citizen perspective 
as well as from the government policy perspective as well. Now, I'm going to answer you now as to from both of these things that where we need to, to focus on. From a public policy point of view, the key thing here is to ensure that you, 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 in South Africa, we have a public sector education where the, the teacher unions are very much dominant, you know, to a point that they can stall any kind of very important educational reforms. So you need to put in policies or a political structure that will sort of reduce the impact of labor unions in the educational, or I should say teacher unions in the educational sector, because the teacher, the teacher unions actions can disadvantage, you know, the education of young people. That's one element. So the second element is also to encourage the, the growth of independent schools as well. And I, li I like to use the word low fee private schools or low fee independent schools. Why? Because you want to have, you are creating competition in the education market and, it, in a, and it's competition between, you know, the public sector, you know, public schools and the independent schools. It's competition between independent schools as well as also the, you know, I'm sorry, between independent schools themselves. So you need, you need that competition so that it, it, it holds people who are operating in that market um, accountable, right? If they make bad decisions, they pay the price. If they make, you know, good decisions, they get, they get the rewards. So we also have to look into that. We also need to look at, um, from this, this is from a government perspective. We also need to look at the quality of teachers that we have. How do you, in the public sector education, how do we have high quality teachers? Because these, these are suppliers of education. They are supplying knowledge to young people in the basic, basic education space. So have high quality teachers, which means they need very strong training, right? In the fields that you know, young people need to be taught in, so have high quality, quality teachers, and if they are high, high quality, reward them as well, well, right? And their quality must, must not be the fact that, you know, they have high degrees or whatever. Um, their quality must be that they can produce very good grades at, at educational level. So in other words, you are, you, you are just, you, you are upping the level of quality within the educational sector. So those are things that those are things that we need to look at. Now there's also the matter of um, infrastructure. That is, we need to. We don't want to have kids that are studying with the goats, you know, studying in rooms where there's leaks. There is so we need to, and that infrastructure cannot only be should the government 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 must be open for the private sector to also through what they call you know, corporate social responsibility or giving back to societies, encourage, encourage the private sector to be able to, 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 play, to play into that space as well. Another last thing that government can do is also to, I see, you see, I see government as an, an, um, a, a mechanism that needs to enable people to do things freely um, in the market. Uh, so long as those things are lawful, of course, uh, and they don't, you know, damage or intrude in, in other people's, um, you know, private rights. Government can sort of encourage, sort of be on the drive on the importance of education. How do we see education as something that can help people? How to, so they go about basically spreading the knowledge of the importance, trying to influence the mindsets, not forcing people, but highlighting the importance of these things so that people can, young people and the parents and everybody can see the value 
of enough education. So what I've just laid out to you is what government can or should do. Now, I've, I have spoken a lot about the importance of personal responsibility. Now, even if, now, even if government would have very good policies that I advocate for, if there is no personal, a, a, sense, a sense of personal responsibility amongst the private citizens, then those policies won't achieve much. In other words, if you're a parent, make sure that you get closer to your child's education, right? Understands that your child needs to come back from school and be, you know, and be in an environment where she can do her homework. Encourage the child to do her homework, right? Know what the child is going through from an educational level. Assist, help, you know, pay money to get tutors. Uh, as a parent to, to help you to help your kid to to be to grasp to grasp the content of of of, of what they, they are learning and to, to motivate them be there for your kids education don't just send the child the child to school then comes back you feed them and that's it be closer be in touch with your kids education that's very important because it begins at home it's all in the home if the home is not there and the home does not prioritize value education at a higher level then other people will you know will come and um and um and you know and and and, and make more success in the market so i mean and also not only that the citizens must hold the principals in schools um the, the government education officials accountable. If they are not doing something right, then remove them out of power through the lawful constitutional process. So, I mean, we need to look at this from both sides. I don't believe in this thing. I hated this thing of people saying, government this, government that. Well, government hasn't done enough. Well, Government is government because we installed the people who are serving. We installed those people there. We put them into power. So the citizens, really, they are critical as well um, in the success of their, of their society. We cannot discount that. We must never discount that. All right, thank you so much, Pumlani. Um, we've run out of time. I would love to have you here for another two hours to talk about the very important topics. Um, yeah, yeah. You no, know, but <laughs> shortly we are out of time. And I would like to thank you once again for availing yourself to shed light on the topic why is Africa poor and the world's rich. You've done very beautiful uh, the topic. You also make me proud uh, to have a role model like you. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much. I hope to see you again on the show. Um, from that um, to the audience, we'll see you next time. Pumlani, if you have any few words to say before we we, we go off. I, 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 my, ad, my advice is just um, simple. Um, we need to be a society that is responsible. Uh, personal responsibility is very important. It is very important to blame other people to blame the West, the Chinese, um, other civilizations. No, let's not do that. Let's be responsible for the African continent, shape it for the benefit of all of us, make the right decisions, then we can make you know, um, a big impact. We can become a society you know, that grows faster. Thanks. Thank you so much for learning. The information on this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not investment or financial advice. Please do your own research before making any investment decisions. None of the information on this podcast constitutes or should be relied on as a suggestion, offer, or other solicitation to engage in 
or refrain from engaging in any purchase, sale, or any other investment-related activity with respect to any STO or other transaction.